Um, so uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, um, we um, are still unclear as to whether, whether we will have the uh, annual conference in May or, or maybe in, in person in, in December, that has to be decided. And uh, we are glad to, to keep in touch with everyone uh, online. In the meantime, uh, hopefully after the summer, we'll all be back and could meet, meet in person. Uh, so I, for now, uh, um, I hope that everyone is keeping in touch and, and writing papers on black holes. And if there is anything we can do, Nicole and I, Nicole is doing a great job in uh, keep, uh, keeping us informed through the weekly news, newsletters uh, about uh, the latest news on black holes. But um, if there is anything we can do to help any of you during uh, the time being administratively, just let us know. Uh, and without further ado, I will let um, either Fabio or Achilles introduce our next speaker. All right, so today is our pleasure to host Matthew Lister. He's a professor of physics and astronomy at the Purdue University. And his research interests range from active galactic nuclei, astrophysical jets and shocks, quasars and uh, BLAC objects, narrow line safer galaxies and very long baseline interferometry. So today he's going to talk in particular about parsec scale jetted outflows powered by supermassive black holes. So Matthew, please take it away. Okay, great. Uh, let me just share my screen here. Okay, does that look good for everyone? Okay, so uh, just to introduce myself, uh, I'm a professor at Purdue University and I'm actually on research leave in Boston. I've been here many months and I hope to see you all in person very soon. And I thought I'd talk to you today a bit about a project that I lead called uh, Mojave. And we are studying these outflows from uh, supermassive black holes that are powered by supermassive black holes. And I'm just gonna start by acknowledging my collaborators, which involve uh, people here in the US and across Europe. And this acronym, uh, it's actually an acronym within an acronym. It's monitoring, monitoring of jets and active galaxies with PLVA experiments. And our primary instrument is the very long baseline array. So a little outline of the talk, I'll give you a brief introduction to the VLBA and uh, the Mojave program, and then discuss how we are using the VLBA to learn about the kinematics of these jets on parsec scales. And in particular, a recent discovery of an interesting gamma ray emitting jet system that recently restarted. And then uh, towards the end, I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing with jet polarization and Faraday rotation imaging. Okay, so this is probably going to primarily going to be an observational based talk, but just so that we're all situated, we are talking about phenomena that are, that are primarily accretion disk driven. So you've got a supermassive black hole and a superheated accretion disk, and there's parts of the accretion disk that are being launched into this highly collimated uh, outflow of plasma, and it's a non stable process. There's chunks of the accretion disk that come off. And these condensations are enhanced regions of either magnetic field or uh, plasma density that give rise to large flares that we see all the way from radio through gamma rays. And in, because the flow is relativistic, if it's pointing right at us, you get the full effects of relativistic aberration and the things can be highly Doppler boosted, the radiation. So why do we study these things? Well, they're the most powerful long lived phenomenon in the universe. And because they're so luminous, you can study them out to a very high redshift. And so that gives us a, a nice way of probing both the material inside the host galaxies, but also on kiloparsec to megaparsec scales, because these things can reach enormous lengths. And uh, here's an X-ray image of Perseus A, which shows how the jets have blown out these cavities in the intergalactic medium. And that's actually a process by which uh, it's a feedback mechanism that regulates the growth of galaxies at high redshift. So we really need to not understand the, the physics of jets, how they interact with the medium and their duty cycles if we really wanna know about galaxy formation. Another good reason to study them is they dominate the sky. So in particular at some wavelengths like gamma rays, if you look off the galactic plane, almost everything you see is a relativistic jet from an AGN pointing right at us. 
And in the radio regime, when you go to higher frequencies, say about, about 15 gigahertz, this is the AT20 gigahertz sur survey, which is down in the Southern hemisphere. 99% uh, of the sources here are these, uh, what we call blazars, the jets pointing right at us. So the primary instrument that we use in the Mojave program is the VLBA. It's been around since 1995. And it's a dedicated array that's jointly shared between NRAO and the US Naval Observatory. That's about 50-50 share in the time. And it operates between these wavelengths, 90 centimeters down to three millimeters, and gives you a max angular resolution at three millimeters of about 0.2 milli arc seconds. And just for comparison, that's about four times the M87 uh, ring diameter. So we cannot resolve uh, the way EHT does. But because we're sensitive to the steep spectrum emission, we have we can go down to lower wavelengths, uh, sorry, longer wavelengths. We can ob observe the jet phenomena. So with fairly good resolution. So if you go to redshift one, it's about one and a half parsecs. And with the VLBA, we've managed to look at these individual bright radio sources with high resolution and see that there's main, there's three main classes. So there's the blazar jets, which are at a small angle to the line of sight, where there actually is a counter jet here, but we can't see it because it's been beamed away from us. There's an unresolved, optically thick, what we call a core feature, which is near the base of the jet. And then there's um, jet emission, which is radio synchrotron emission with individual bright features that we can track and I'll show you some animations of that a bit later on. These particular features can move at faster than light apparent speeds because we see them projected on the sky and they're coming very close to our line of sight at near relativistic speeds. So that gives them an actual superluminal effect of transverse motion. If you take these type of jets and you move them closer to the plane of the sky, then you start to see the counter jet. And so this is Cygnus A, a famous uh, double-sided radio galaxy where the AGN sits down in here. These tend to have slower apparent speeds because they don't, they're not as affected by these relativistic uh, effects. And then finally, there's another class called uh, young radio sources that are much smaller scales here. They typically, their jets turned off, turned on about a few thousand years ago. And they are advancing very slowly at uh, speeds of maybe 10th the speed of light. So that's relatively slowly in this business. And they're pushing their way through the interstellar medium of their host galaxy. And there's a large interaction between the jets and uh, there's a working surface here that enhances the radio emission that we see. So the Mojave program, uh, it started with the VLBA back in 1995 as the VLBA two centimeter survey. And 2002, we narrowed it down to a flux limited uh, sample and we did full polarization observations. And now we've added sources based on their radio flux density and gamma ray detection by the Fermi Observatory. So we're up to about 500 jets now that cover two thirds of the sky. So this is a, a, a large long-term survey. And the individual time baselines on the sources, they range from about two years to 26 years. So this is ideal for studying very slow motions that we can see on the sky in these sources. And we have an extensive on live archive, uh, nearly 10,000 images at two centimeter wavelength. Uh, again, they're full polarization. Uh, the resolution we get is about half a milli arc second, which looks uh, you know, fairly blobby in the image, but because this is inframetric data, we can actually get astrometric positions of the individual features to much higher accuracy down to 50 micro arc seconds. So this is the same jet, but this is one feature that we tracked over eight years. And you can see it actually moves outward along the jet axis. We published our results in a series of papers. There's the Roman numeral papers and also the individual source papers and our full publication list. You can go and find it right here. Okay, so the way we look at the jet kinematics is by fitting the radio emission that we see with individual Gaussians and we can track those Gaussian features from epoch to epoch, and we can fit them with just with two types of fit, just a simple radial motion fit outwards, and then a two-dimensional constant acceleration fit on the sky. 
So this particular uh, jet here, the base of the jet is down uh, somewhere in here. This feature number 11, here's the world line for it. So this is separation from the base of the jet, which we assume is stationary over time. And you can see this one is moving out steadily, whereas some of these other features are clearly accelerating. So a bit more on that later. So because these jets are coming at us uh, at between zero and 10 degrees the line of sight approximately, we're actually probing distances between 10 uh, parsecs and a kiloparsec from the central engine. And because our survey is so large, we've actually looked at over 1,500 individual jet features. So we have extremely good statistics. And today I'll describe an overview of what we've learned from uh, looking at this number of, of jets. So here is a animation. This is a time-lapse movie of 3C273, the first quasar ever be discovered. And there's a lot going on here. <laughs> this, the false color is the radio synchrotron emission at uh, way about two centimeters. The individual spots are the positions of Gaussians that we fit to those bright features in the jet. And you can see them emerging and moving downstream. And these are the actual fits uh, that we've done to those positions. And so some of these features we can track for 15 years or more. They move down, steadily down the jet. And you can see nothing's ballistic here. And if you've noticed, the jet started out going in this direction and is now moving in this direction. So these are things that we'll uh, address a bit later on in the talk. As I mentioned before, most of these features are moving at very fast speeds, greater than apparent speed of light speeds because of the fact that they're coming at us at near relativistic speed. Okay, so overview of what we've learned. When we first started the project, there was some debate about whether these were actual pattern speeds or something that reflects the true flow. We can now say we are actually seeing the true flow. And one of the reasons is that when we look at the individual jet, some of the features do come out with a range of speeds, but there's an overall median speed. And so if there was, these were just pure patterns, this distribution would be very flat here, but you can see it's peaked around a median speed. So there are some minor differences. So there, are, there is some pattern, but overall we actually are seeing the, the overall flow here. Another thing you might expect from if they were just purely patterns is half of them will be inward towards the base of the jet and half would be outwards. That's certainly not the case. 97% uh, of them are moving outward. The 3% that are inward, and so this is a zoom in here of this, the base of the jet is down in here. This particular feature is moving towards the jet base. Uh, and here's the world line here. There's three possible explanations for this. One is that these are really inward, that you're seeing some sort of reverse shock phenomenon in the flow. Another is that you've got a feature which is moving on a curved trajectory and it crosses the line of sight. So that can give an illusion of it moving inward. And the other possibility is that maybe this is not the true core of the jet, that we have misidentified it, and uh, that, that means it's not a stable uh, reference point. Another thing that proves that these aren't patterns is that we actually see the individual features accelerating. So 60% of the jets have at least one accelerating feature or a non-radial moving feature. And by this, we mean you look at, look at the motion vector and it doesn't trace backwards to the core location. And then 40% of the features actually show evidence of acceleration. So here's a clear example of the, a bright spot in the jet. This is its position in December, 2009. And this is its, these are its positions over a period of about eight to 10 years. And you can see this nice curved trajectory. When we look at the statistics of the accelerations, the accelerations parallel to the motion vectors are larger and more prevalent than perpendicular. And again, if these were patterns, this would not, there wouldn't be a trend here. These results have also been confirmed in some other VLBI surveys uh, done at different wavelengths, four centimeters, and uh, Alan Marsher and Svetlana Jorstad's group at seven millimeters of VLBA. Another interesting thing that we see is that these accelerations are not random. They look like they are illustrating collimation of the jet flow. And this is well downstream of the base of the jet. 
So let's look at this particular jet right here. So over time, we can develop a mean position angle. You can see the main flow direction is along this green dashed arrow. This particular feature here, we know from tracking it is moving off with this instantaneous velocity vector. But the acceleration of that feature is in this direction towards the jet axis. So that is a trend that we see on almost all of these accelerating features. They might be look like they're going the wrong way instantaneously, but they're accelerating that curved trajectory, which is bringing them back in. And this was dramatically illustrated in 3C279 of a, a bright quasar. If you watch this feature right here, the main jet direction is down to the south and it looked like it was going the wrong way. And then suddenly in 1999, it changed direction and is now moving towards the larger scale jet. And then you can see another feature here was, was launched a bit later, later. And it's not following the same path, but interestingly, it is curving and it will follow down and join up the exact location of this one down near the base. Uh, sorry, far, far further down from the core. So this is an illustration of what you can do with uh, more than 15 years of VLBA data. Okay, so these accelerations, um, I mentioned that they, they bring the features inward, they're, they're, they're culminating the flow, but there's also a trend in that as you move down the jet, you get more, uh, you go from outward accelerations to inward ones. So they, the jets are essentially speeding up near the base and slowing down further downstream. And with so much statistics, uh, sorry, sorry, with so much good statistics that we have, you can basically determine that the, it's not just a purely bending effect. So remember, we're seeing the speeds projected on the sky. So you could change the apparent speed and, and have an apparent acceleration just by having a curved trajectory, but that does not fit uh, the overall statistics. It, what we found is that the jets must, the, these individual features, their Lorentz factors have to be changing and not just their directions. Another thing you might uh, expect uh, from hydrodynamic simulations of overpressured jets are standing features. So this would be a standing wave in the flow uh, something similar to shock beads that you might see in the space shuttle uh, or rocket exhausts or uh, supersonic airplane exhausts. And we do see these uh, standing shocks. They're rare. They're only about 3% of all the features we've seen, although 20% of the jets do have one. Um, by stationary, we mean we've, we've been able to track these things and find their speeds are less than 20 micro arc seconds per year. Just for curiosity, if... <laughs> It's a bad pun there. The Curiosity rover on Mars, the typical Mars distance, it moves about three milli arc seconds a year on Mars. <laughs> so we're measuring things that are 20 micro arc seconds a year. That gives you an idea of how accurate the VLBA is. So most of these standing features are very close to the jet base. Uh, so within uh, four par parsecs, if you just project that on the sky. And uh, there is not that many of them. So we still are working out the physics of these. There's a recent study that we published on uh, a long-term feature in BLLAC. Uh, so if you're interested, in, you can look at this reference right here. Now, I mentioned that video of 3C273 that the, the parent direction of the jet changes. This is a fairly common thing that we see, not actually half of the jets we look at. Here's another dramatic example of this uh, jet OJ287, which in 1996 looked like it was going this direction and by 2011 it was coming down in here and back and it was back to the old direction in 2018. So this is that position angle in the sky versus time and you can see it, it rapidly changed in a short amount. Uh, another thing you might notice is that there's tantalizing suggestions of oscillatory behavior here but the periods are long so this is a in this one case it might be about 11 year period. So we really need to keep up the long-term monitoring to see if this continues. Uh, this is being suggested as a possibility of seeing actual jet precession or even black hole spin precession if the jets are coming out of the black hole spin axis. But uh, as you'll see in a minute that there may be something more to that. And the reason is, is that when we look at an individual epoch image, we're not seeing the full jet width. 
we're seeing just the regions of the jet that are currently being energized. So if you were to look at this uh, particular quasar over time, the features might come along, and these are the velocity vectors here uh, in this direction, but then a bit later, we'll launch a feature in this direction. And so if you stack all the epochs together, what looked like a bent jet here becomes a nice conically smooth jet. Uh, this is an animation that we put together that shows this. Back in 1995, you could just see the core. There was no jet at all. And now you can uh, see certainly a, a large jet that's come out. And if you stack it, it all looks conical. So this idea of the whole jet processing might not be fully correct. It looks like the, the jet cone is there all the time, and it's the features that are energized that vary um, as they, they uh, you can see these, these features come out with different position angles. Taking those stacked images and finding the, they're actually conical allows us to uh, actually look at the shape of the jet as a function of distance. And we found there's a transition that happens. It's almost a universal thing between parabolic to conical. And it seems to happen in around 10 to the five short radii. Individual jets, if you look at their jet width as a function of distance from the jet base, they undergo this transition. And this also seems to be the spot where we're seeing these jet accelerations and collimations. So there's this K index here. So if you, if you make this the jet diameter here and model it as R to the K, uh, K equal one is a conical and profile which is shown here, and then Kago half is a parabolic profile. And this is an individual, this is this jet right here. It goes from parabolic to conical right around um, this projected distance right here. We've been also looked at the speed distribution. So again, a little bit about the Lorentz factor, if you can make some assumptions about the viewing angle. The parent speeds that we see are up to about 50, and so that means the Lorentz factors reach up to about 50. But you can see those jets are quite rare. Uh, there's only a dozen with speed above 30. But the, the fact that this isn't a uniform distribution suggests that they're not all the same Lorentz factor. So there's a range of jet speeds in the parent population. And we've been able to model the parent population through uh, Monte Carlo simulations. So it's, an, it's essentially, it's an inversion problem where we're given four observables here, uh, the actual jet flux, the distance, uh, the observed luminosity, the parent jet speed. And we want to invert that to determine what the true jet speed distribution is, their uh, true luminosities that are prior to being relativistically boosted. So when you do that, uh, you find that uh, this is not a surprise that if you do a flux limited sample of just the brightest jets in the sky, they're all pointing at us. So that's a Doppler bias because uh, a single jet can change its apparent flux by up to a factor of 10 to the five, just by changing its orientation on the sky. So when you model the parent population, you find that most of the parent objects have much lower synchrotron power than blazars and Lorentz factor is much less than 10. So you often see this sort of rule of thumb that AGN jets, while they have Lorentz factors of 10, that's only true of blazars. If you were just randomly take an AGN jet in a volume limited sample, you'd find it's only mildly relativistic. And so the actual distribution is about gamma to the minus 1.4. So it's a fairly steep power law. These are the distributions that you'd find for a blazar sample, like our what we look at in Mojave. So you can see, yes, they, they are peaked at 10 and the Doppler factors are around 15 or so. But the, if the parent population luminosities are all down in here. So we're seeing a big bias when we look at a uh, blazar sample that's selected on flux. Now I mentioned that the Fermi uh, mission has scanned the sky in gamma rays and almost every source off the galactic plane is a blazar but not all of them. And one interesting one that we looked at with Mojave turned out to be not a blazar, but at one of these young radio sources. So we were able to track the motions 
in uh, this particular source and notice that there's an inner jet here, which is much brighter than this outer structure. So what you're seeing here is a portion of a elliptical cocoon that the jet has blown out of the inter uh, interstellar medium in the host galaxy. And by backtracing the motions, we can uh, determine that this shell was launched, the jet that launched the shell, that created the shell was launched about 80 years ago. Then there was a period where the jet turned off. So you can see it's not connected between the inner and outer uh, region here. This outer shell is still now coasting outwards about a third the speed of light. This new jet is also moving outwards. And if you look at the energetics and do uh, some modeling of the cocoon, you find that it cannot be producing the gamma rays. It doesn't nearly produce enough theoretically. So it should be this small jet that's producing the gamma rays. So uh, this was made for an interesting press release this past summer because uh, the jet has an uncanny resemblance to Darth Vader's TIE fighter. <laughs> so this got a lot of traction at NASA HQ. Uh, it just for kicks, the, the background here is the Death Star. And you might remember that uh, Death Star looks a lot like the Moon of Mimas. So I don't know, George Lucas must have been incredibly uh, prescient to, to determine these things before they were discovered. OK, so. Uh, Let's move on now to polarization properties of these jets. So we can look at the linear polarization. The, it turns out in circular polarization, they're all very weak, these particular uh, uh, jets. But they are strongly linearly polarized, which suggests that there's magnetic fields that uh, are threaded in the flow and dictate the, uh, the flow dynamics. So we can measure the electric vectors through the directions. We can also measure the fractional polarization. And so the fractional polarization tells us about the order of the magnetic field. And if the emission is optically thin, then the direction of the E vectors, uh, with some caveats with relativistic aberration, tells us about the magnetic field direction. And the model that's been around for quite some time is this transverse shock model, where you've got initially a random field, and there might be a shock in the flow. It could be a standing shock or a moving shock, and that compresses the field. And so it makes the magnetic field perpendicular to the jet axis and the electric vectors parallel to the jet axis. More contemporary view is that there's helical fields. Uh, this is predicted in some uh, models that involve the idea of the, the flow starting out as pointing dominated and, and eventually converted to a matter dominated. That's most uh, easily configured with the helical field. And so because a helical field is asymmetric, from an observer's point of view, we can look at the Faraday rotation effects. And what's interesting is that the same jets seem to have a time variable rotation measure. So the, the gradient across here in rotation measure, which is shown here, goes from positive to negative, suggests a helical field where one side of the field is pointing towards us and the other uh, is moving away from us, the magnetic field vector. But you can see that it changes, and this is only a period of a few months, three months apart. And so that suggests there might be an external screen that's doing this. So may maybe there's a slower moving sheath that's surrounding this particular jet flow that's causing the Faraday rotation. This type of uh, observing is highly intensive. It takes a lot of uh, data to do this, and it's only been done for a few jets. So we've embarked in a program to do 25 of these systematically with the Mojave program at, at these three, three wavelengths. Uh, we're still processing the data here. It's a big project. But the idea is to do mapping uh, on monthly intervals and see how these things are changing to determine whether it's an external screen or perhaps internal Faraday rotation that we're seeing. OK, so the last topic I'll talk about is this uh, more recent thing, which is uh, that fact that these AGN jets could be neutrino emitters. Now, prior to 2018, we only knew of two uh, extraterrestrial neutrino sources, which is the Sun and Supernova 1987A. But then in September 2017, the Ice Cube Observatory at the South Pole detected a TEV neutrino from which happened to be the same direction of the sky as this blazar. And what caught everyone's attention was that this blazar was actually undergoing a large gamma ray flare at the same time. 
So what they did was they went back and stacked the data and binned it up, the ice cube data, and found that that particular source, that location in the sky, there was a neutrino excess as well between September 2014 and March 2015. But interesting, there was no gamma ray flare. So this is a hot topic. Uh, there's 30 papers came out just this last year alone on just on this object. What we're seeing here is the uh, ice cube data. This is the flare in 2017, at the end of 2017. And then this was the that period where they detect the excess. In black here is the weekly at binned Fermi gamma ray light curve. This is above uh, about 0.1 GeV. And the red dots are the Mojave monitoring. And it shows a few things here. So there was, here's the concurrent flare with the neutrino event, but you can see there's no concurrent flaring activity down in here, which is interesting. And then the other thing is this source is now shooting up in radio flux density since 2016. So there's lots of unresolved questions here. Uh, this is the only uh, so far joint neutrino gamma ray event seen in an AGN. People have looked for statistics between gamma ray sources and neutrino sources and found none. So we're sort of looking at the whole sky. And so it suggests there's, there's big uncertainty here about what the mechanism is. So to produce these type of energy uh, neutrinos, you need to have um, proton, this is the best uh, mechanism so far, is proton initiated cascades. You need, the pre, you need proton energies that are about 20 to 40 times the TeV and uh, that's the TeV neutrino energy. So what's favored right now are these proton gamma uh, or proton photon interactions. So there's some uncertainties about whether you know what the seed photons are for the cascade and whether the gamma rays can make it out or not. Uh, these are all questions that uh, need to be addressed. And one of the ways to do this is to, is to look at a larger sample of objects. So the, the Ice Cube collaboration just came out with a, a paper a few weeks ago where they detected three other AGN. But then the question is, why is it these just these three? So this particular one is not a blazar, for example. These two are blazars. And them and TXS0506, which we've been been monitoring with Mojave for some years. There's nothing particularly special about them. This particular source uh, doesn't have a fast speed. Remember, the speeds can go up to about 50 C, and this one's only 1 C. And uh, as far as polar parsec polarization structure, there's nothing particularly special about it. So we're in this realm of small number statistics. So our plans for the future then are to regularly monitor uh, this complete flux limited sample in the northern sky for three years. We just been a proposal yesterday actually on this. And then this will follow up on uh, some recent papers with our group that have found statistical relation between the parsec scale AGN flux and uh, high energy neutrino events. We also plan to keep on uh, tracking accelerating features in about 68 AGN and then continue our multi-frequency polarization analysis. Okay, so to sum up then, um, the VLBA, it's an unparalleled facility for studying jet phenomena. And jet phenomena are very important, uh, not only for understanding galaxy evolution, but also studying black holes indirectly. And Mojave is the largest and longest running program on the BLBA. And we've been able to determine uh, various things about the flows, they're accelerating, they're collimating on scales that are much larger than we thought initially would be occurring. These features that move down the, the, the jets, they're not ballistic, they move on curved trajectories, they can be very fast, but your typical AGN jet is only mildly, mildly relativistic. So the ones we're looking at with the BLBA are a highly biased subset. And we plan to keep on uh, investigating these activity cycles as well as gamma ray and neutrino emission. And if you're interested in, in seeing more of the movies, uh, you can go to our website down at here. Okay, well, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Matthew, for a very interesting talk. And uh, we have time for questions now. 
Any question? Uh, yeah, th this is Chip. I had a question. Yeah, go ahead, Chip. Yeah, um, Matt, great talk. Really nice stuff. It's really remarkable that it's a long running program. I, I had a question about comparing the Mojave results with higher frequency results, like the Al Marshers stuff or the, from the GMVA. When you look at sources that you have a lot of Mojave data on and you look closer to the core because of self-absorption and you get higher angular resolution, do you see a consistent story in the opacities and, and do you even see potentially the, the beginnings of some of the blobs or some of the Gaussians that you're tracking with Mojave earlier on at the higher frequencies? Yes, so we, there is some overlap there of the two regimes. Uh, what ends up happening is the sensitivity of the LBA drops off dramatically as you go up in uh, frequency and also the emission itself gets weaker because it's deep spectrum. But sometimes you get a feature which is bright enough that it continues down and you can still see it at, at 42 gigahertz. And so we can actually, it's helpful to do that because if you want to backtrace the acceleration, oh, sorry, accelerating features and figure out when they were emitted, for example, you need to know that information when they're close to the, the jet base, as close as you can get. And so the, the reduced opacity at 43 gigahertz is very helpful for that and also the better angular resolution. So there is, there is quite a bit of uh, consistency that we see. Yeah, because for, for, for 3C279, when we looked at it at, at one millimeter wavelength, you saw some pretty extreme bending and on scales mm -hmm. much closer to the black hole. And so it's, it's interesting to think about whether that's consistent, whether the, the bending you're seeing on Mojave scales, uh, how it has its genesis with also extreme bending closer in. Yeah, so that, that seems to be a more and more common thing to see that those large bends. And it's a result, I believe, of, of very small viewing angles, which are exaggerating those bends tremendously. And also a, a particular form of bias in that if you have a curved jet, imagine just orienting that in three space if you can figure out an orientation where a portion of that jet makes zero viewing angle to you, it's gonna be super bright. And that particular viewing angle happens when the jet is bending across your line of sight. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And that's where you get the, the, the extreme trajectory changes yeah. too. Yeah, the, the, that is a consistent story. Okay. If you got something bending across your line of sight, if you just tweak it a little bit, it suddenly turns into a big hook. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, thanks. Uh, we have a question from Dan. Yeah, you uh, point out that only the blazars have the uh, extreme relativistic uh, uh, jets. But of course, for every blazar, there's two times gamma squared similar objects spread around the sky. And aren't mm -hmm. these part of the quote, typical AGN population? And how might they be recognized? And, and be manif and manifest. Yeah, certainly. Uh, and we do um, we do investigate that actually for every object, how many parent objects you get uh, in that recent Mojave paper. And it's difficult, right? Because when the source is in the plane of the sky, the maximum speed you can get is C. So that's often difficult to measure on decadal types of time scales. It has been done. Um, but you can't get a Lorentz factor very easily because the difference between say 0.99 and C and 0.97 C is hard to measure. Uh, whereas if that particular jet was coming at you, you would see you know, 5 C versus 40 C kind of thing. So there certainly are those. And then uh, as far as the parent objects for these blazars, we looked at their space densities and they're most consistent with FR2, the most powerful uh, radio galaxies. So that makes them rare as well. So most of the AGN jet population are lower luminosity jets. So there does appear to be some sort of relation between the overall synchrotron power, true synchrotron power, forget about beaming, and the uh, speed of the flow.
Okay, we have a question from Sophia. Hey, thanks for your talk. My question is about the oscillatory behavior that you note in, for example, OG287, which changes apparent direction. You talk about how this might be oscillatory behavior, or it might just be that the energy is just um, kind of currently energizing different regions that, that already exist. And I want to understand what the difference is between these two things. If the energy is energizing different places, isn't that just isn't that also oscillatory behavior? Or is yeah, it so yeah. It's the difference between the overall jet axis moving back and forth and things within the jet cone moving back forth, back and forth. So one way to think about it is that there's an overall conical outflow. And we see small features that don't occupy the full jet cross section. So there's a trend that the one feature will emerge, say, in this direction, and the next feature will emerge along the same direction. But five years later, they'll start emerging along a different direction. But the overall conical flow hasn't changed. OK. Now, what causes that the jet to launch things in this direction and this one? That's an interesting question, <laughs> which we don't have a good answer to yet. Uh, these, these particular features could be the result of uh, perhaps something like helical instability modes, where the, the instability mode is has to have a driving force to it. So there, maybe there's some sort of torque being uh, imparted on the system from, you know, there's evidence in maybe one or two sources that might could be blind, binary black hole, or yeah. it could be accretion disk, a warp accretion disk torque. I don't know if that's enough torque to do that, but something is causing a, a secular change in the outflow directions of these bright features. Oh, I can show you another example, which I didn't have time to show you, but here's another one where we're, it's a little more dicey. Let's see if I can find it here. Let's start at the end. This is an interesting case, which I looked at many years ago. This is uh, an ultraluminous infrared galaxy, and it's got two nuclei. This nucleus here is radio bright, and this one isn't. They're about five kiloparsecs apart. And if you zoom into the nucleus of this one, you see a jet structure, and this is the counter jet. This is a jet coming at us. The black hole is in here. And you can model this particular jet as a conical helix. So imagine a helix that's wrapped around a three-dimensional cone here. Okay. So in this case, it could be the whole jet axis, which is, um, processing over time. And what makes it tricky is that it's it's not ballistic motion. It's not like you've got a hose and you oscillate the end of the hose and it looks like you make a helix that way. These features are actually moving around the bend. Interesting. So, Thank you so, so much. So it's a complicated uh, magnetic hydrodynamic uh, <laughs> force uh, here. <laughs> yeah. Clearly. Thank you. And we have a question from Christian. Hello. So you showed this collimation profiles. Mm -hmm. and there is this band at 10 to the 5 RG. So yes. Can you actually resolve this region? And do you know what, what is there? Is there a standing feature or exactly this one? Yes. Yeah, so the, the short answer to this is that we don't really have enough. So there's only a dozen or so jets where we can clearly see the transition. So uh, Yuri Kovalov is, is, we've actually have launched a uh, program to look at nearby radio galaxy jets. So these are fainter, so they require a little more observations than Mojave can provide. Uh, so the idea is you wanna be able to have nearby jets to resolve the cross section. And as far as standing features, you don't typically see anything there. It's just a change in the jet profile. So what looks like it's it's conical suddenly flares outwards. 
and Yuri had a uh, another whimsical press release where he mentioned this is like bell bottom jeans or flaring jeans. <laughs> and and this is at fifteen gigahertz, so that's uh, right. Yeah. Can can you repeat this at forty three, for example, to get better resolution? That's right. Yeah, you can extend this down, uh, particularly for the higher redshift objects. Uh, that's useful. Um, that's only been done for a few, like M87 has this behavior as well. Yes. And the reason they know that is they've looked at M87 at a variety of different wavelengths. Plus M87 is so close that you can get really good transverse resolution uh, and see both uh, edges quite clearly. Okay, thank you. All right, so if there are no more questions, let's... Uh, I have another one, if that's okay, yeah, sure, um, sure. Fabio, I just one more. Um, I was so curious, you were talking about how the collimation can happen fairly far out on kind of tens of parsec mm -hmm. scales. And I was wondering what incites that? Yeah, there's, there's two possibilities. One is it's the change in the external medium. So we think in 3C279 that that might correspond to a, a, a change in density. So when, perhaps if you, re, if you leave the narrow line region uh, around a kiloparsec. Another possibility it has, has to do with this idea that we're of the accelerations um, changing from outward to inward. Uh, this happens here at projected distances of maybe 20 parsec. And so you deproject that, you have to multiply it by maybe a factor of eight or so. Uh, so if you've got a, a jet speeding up or slowing down, then that can cause a, a, a flaring effect on the jet boundary. So those are the two main possibilities that, again, need further investigating. How does uh, speeding up or slowing down change the direction? Uh, like, I, I understand mm -hmm. how if you're changing direction, you're speeding up or slowing down, but yeah, yeah. Um, the other way is not so clear. Uh, so in this case, we're talking about change in speed. OK, so you're yeah. changing the speed mm -hmm. uh, around the part where you start recollimating. You have something that's going out that's now going in. Uh, but why does it also change direction? Oh, the, well, the jet bound, you're talking about the jet boundary. Here. Yeah. Yeah, so that one, so, so 279 over here, it's almost like a refraction. Imagine you've got an overpressure jet where uh, the jet pressure changes, that can cause a, a focusing of the flow. That's the best way I can explain that one. Okay, thank you. Uh, the other thing you should that I perhaps didn't mention is that the intrinsic change here is only maybe half a degree. So it's highly exaggerated because we're seeing the thing end on. I see. That's helpful. Thank you. All right. So as I was saying, if there are no more questions, uh, let's talk our speaker again for a very nice talk. And uh, we will see you next week. The uh, another BHA colloquy. Thank okay, you. Okay, thanks, Matt. Bye. Thanks, Fabio. Hey, you're welcome. Thanks, everyone. Bye. -bye.